the Lord. What a wonderful presence of the Lord is here already. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We are going to the book of Genesis this morning. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. I want to say a warm welcome to all of our first-timers here this morning. Thank you for being here with us, and we hope you come back often. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's great to have you here. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. I want everyone to notice that word come. Come indicates God was already there. God said, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal, a male and his female, that makes 14. Two of each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female, Also seven, each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. Praise God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that it still speaks to us even now, Lord, that it is a living word. And Lord, we thank you for your anointing this morning. I pray, Lord, that somehow, some way, your word, Lord, would, Lord, be transmitted through these lips of clay in a way that enable us, Lord, to grow in you and experience what you would have for us today. In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, for your anointing. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your revelation, illumination, and understanding. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Come, God tells Noah, into the ark. Come into the ark. Abide with me. Spend time in isolation and in safety while the world goes through turmoil, catastrophe, and disaster. That's really kind of describes the last two years, <laughs> the whole pandemic that we have recently come through. It was a time of being in the ark, isolated. <laughs> it was a time of distress and catastrophe and everything else. And may I even suggest that if you're going through a personal disaster or crisis this morning, there is an ark for you as well. And his name is Jesus. And whatever you're going through, you can retreat into a place of safety in his arms. You can pull into that place of comfort and peace. In fact, Noah's name means comfort. And you can find comfort in the ark. You can find rest in Jesus Christ this morning. That that ark represents our salvation, first of all. It is God's priority for your life. Many times our priorities and God's priorities do not line up. We come to God with our priorities, but God has priorities for us as well. And God does not ignore our priorities. God understands the things that we face and that we go through. In fact, he asks us to cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. So we do not need to be shy or embarrassed about bringing our needs to the Lord and sharing our concerns, our stress, and our problems with the Lord. He asks us to. We are to bring our needs to the Lord. But when we do, we need to come with an openness and an understanding and recognizing that God also has priorities for us. That God's number one priority for your life is to see you saved. It did not matter that God had a relationship with Noah if Noah was not in the ark when the flood came. It would not have helped. Noah still needed to be in the ark. Even though Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and he had a wonderful relationship with God, when the time came for the flood, he still had to be in the ark. Praise God. So first of all, our salvation is God's priority, not necessarily our comfort. God's priority for your life is not necessarily your comfort. 
That's usually our priority. We're concerned about our comfort. If something is making us uncomfortable, we're like, oh, God, help me now. Get me out of this mess. Deliver me from this disaster. Get me out of this situation, whatever it takes. And God's like, I'm more worried about your salvation. We pray when we're uncomfortable, but salvation is most important. So God called Noah into the ark and kept him in a place of safety while the entire world went through its greatest catastrophe of all time where entire continents were moved around and mountains were formed and ocean basins developed and all of that was happening around Noah while he was safe in the ark, and I could go pretty deep in all the scientific side of things. I will spare you this morning. If you are interested in science, you can ask me afterwards. Um, I love all that stuff. But the point this morning is that Noah was safe in a place that God had called him to. In chapter 8 and verse 15, after the flood is over, then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. If God is telling Noah to go out of the ark, that means God is still in the ark. He was with them the whole time. And no matter what you've been through, God has been with you the whole time. Sometimes when God is with us, we ignore him. Sometimes we don't understand why he isn't more actively involved in what we're facing or what we're enduring or what circumstances have happened to us or around us. And we're like, God, where were you when all my family drowned in the flood or whatever? And yet God was with Noah and his family the whole time. He was there. And now he has instructions for them. What do you do after a crisis. That's my title this morning. What do you do after the crisis is over? You see, they went through the crisis. They were in the ark, safe with God, and they endured all of that. They came out. And verse 17, God says, Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. And I want us to notice verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. After the crisis, after they came out, after God had told them it was safe to leave the ark, it's now safe to... Go out and bring the animals out. Everything's safe now. Then Noah built an altar. You see, God had some instructions for them that they were to go and to multiply and fill the earth. But before you can get to all that God has for you, you first of all must build an altar. You have to start at the altar. You've come through some things. You're here this morning. You've You've arrived here safely, and before you can begin to do the work that God has for you and fulfill the purpose that he has for your life, I believe there's a very important step that cannot be neglected. We cannot pass over it. We cannot skip it, and that is this step where Noah builds an altar. Do you have an altar in your life? Are you in a place of prayer before the Lord. We talked in our Sunday school this morning about several altars, an altar of sacrifice, an altar of incense. But do you have an altar of prayer? Is there an altar of sacrifice in your life? It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is amazing to me. There was only a few of these animals left. They were decimated by the flood. They only had what Noah took with him. Two by two of unclean and seven by seven of the clean, making 14 again. So you've only got 14 cows, 14 sheep. 
14 goats or whatever. And he takes from those and sacrifices. You see, the definition of the word sacrifice is that it costs something. When you have an abundance of something and you offer it, it's not a sacrifice. It's an offering. But when it's all you've got and you take and give it to God, that's sacrifice. Praise God. You see, sacrifice costs. So the question is, what are you giving up for the Lord this morning? In fact, the New Testament tells us it should be all of us, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service considering what Jesus has done for us. So Noah builds an altar. Let me suggest the first thing we do after a crisis is thank the Lord. Because Noah's altar is an altar of thanksgiving for bringing them through safely. (laughs) They've been able to exit the ark. They're now in a place of relative safety, and they're ready to rebuild their lives and all of this. And it is an altar of thanksgiving. Going on to verse or chapter 9, sorry, verse 2. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So they are commanded to go out from the ark, and they are commanded to be fruitful and to multiply. Well, uh, we can be thankful for that this morning. If they hadn't, we wouldn't be here. But there's a spiritual application as well. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name. Praise God. We know the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is known as the Great Commission. God has given us a great commission. Jesus rose from the dead. He appears to his disciples. And it wasn't just the 12, by the way. Uh, Corinthians tells us he was seen of over 500 at one time. This is most likely the occasion where that happened. And Jesus commands all of those who would follow him to go and make disciples. Teach the nations. Teach every nation uh, what I've taught you. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Mark 16, 15, parallel passage, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And with these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Praise God. So God has given his church some signs that he is with them. Praise God. That he has uh, promised us the ability to cast out devils. Of course, Satan's under our feet. It says they'll speak with new tongues. That is a supernatural sign of a true believer that they will be able to speak in tongues. And that's a pretty good litmus test. If someone knocks on your door and claims to be a believer or a representative of Christ, ask for demonstration of the Spirit to prove that they are who they say they are. I've done that before, and they failed the test. Uh, (laughs) These signs will follow those who believe. My name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. Well, this is uh, accidentally not suggesting we should chase down rattlesnakes and see if they bite or not. Um, And if they drink anything deadly, that's definitely accidentally, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I'm thankful that our God still heals, that our God still answers prayer, that our God still does miracles, that he still confirms his word with signs following. Praise God. I'm thankful that we serve a God that is real, and he is not retired, and he's not in hiding. Praise God. But he is with us this morning. Praise God. 
Luke 24, 44 to 49, again, a third parallel passage. Then he said to him, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. That's the three categories of the Old Testament, so the entire Old Testament. Verse 45, this is the key verse to understanding everything in the New Testament. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. The disciples had their understanding opened by Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that incredible? I mean, up to this point, if you're reading the Gospels, you might get the impression the disciples don't always get it. Well, from this verse onward, they got it. They got it better than anybody. Praise God. They knew. It was like the lights just got switched on. They understood. They had perfect understanding of the Scriptures. Praise God. And in fact, after this point, they begin to write Scripture themselves as they are anointed by the Holy Ghost. So therefore, we have the New Testament. Praise God. So this is the key verse to understanding that. Some people will try to uh, look down upon the apostles and all this sort of thing, but it's because they have not noticed this verse. There is a switch that happens here. He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance, everybody say repentance, and remission of sins, everybody say remission of sins, should be preached in his name, everybody say his name, to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. 49, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Go to the altar. <laughs> before you can go multiply, before you can go teach the nations, before you can go do miracles, signs, and wonders, before you do any of those things that you've been commissioned to do, you need to go tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Don't go without the Holy Ghost. Don't go without the Spirit of God coming upon you. Don't go without the promise. You need to go back to the altar and receive your promise before you go. Hallelujah. Before you go, build an altar and receive the promise. God has something for you before you go, before you begin to accomplish your purpose that God has for you. There is a promise that you must receive. There's something greater that you must begin with. Praise God. There's a promise first, and it's the promise of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. It's the promise of the Spirit. It's the promise of being filled with the Spirit of God himself. Praise God. Well, let's go back to Noah, finish the story. Genesis chapter 9, verse 12. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. There's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about in here. I find this fascinating, and I found it revelatory this week as I was studying this. But did you ever stop to think about what it would be like if you were on the ark and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and all your cousins drowned? And your grandfather too. And you go through all of that safe in the ark, mind you, But everybody you knew before you got on the ark is now dead because it rained. And there's debate among Bible scholars on this. There's good arguments both directions. But some teach that there had never been rain until the flood. 
And there's some biblical evidence for that. There's some debate about it, like I said. But what if that was true? It had never rained before in your life. And the first time it rains, it rains for 40 days, 40 nights, and everybody you know drowns. And you get off the ark, thankful to be alive. You offer a sacrifice to God. And a few days later, it starts raining. PTSD, anybody? It starts raining. And you're like, God, we just got off the ark. And God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to put a rainbow in the cloud, and it's going to remind you that I'm never again going to flood the entire world and kill everybody like that. Never again. And you look at that rainbow and remember every time it rains that you're safe. God's cure for PTSD was a rainbow. (laughs) Isn't that cool? I thought that was fascinating. I'm like, wow. I never thought of it that way. But why else would God need to promise and make this covenant and all this stuff? It's like God's bending over backwards to let them know it's okay if it's raining. And he lets them know, I'm going to make this covenant. It's never going to rain again. And God gives them this comforting promise in living color of the rainbow. Of course, in today's world, we have people that want to take that symbol and pervert it into something else and basically shake their fist in the face of God and say, you're not going to judge me, and we understand all of that. But biblically, it was God's answer to some people that had experienced a crisis. So that's the first thing. Today, God is making another promise with us. It's the promise of His Spirit, that He will fill us with the Holy Ghost. (laughs) It's also God's answer for PTSD, by the way. (laughs) That God will fill us with His Spirit and save us. He's also giving us the offer of another covenant, a salvation covenant, that we can enter into a covenant of salvation with God through repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and being filled with the Holy Ghost with the Bible sign of speaking in tongues, which is the other sign that God is offering us. You see, God is a God of covenants. And he made this covenant with Noah, and it had a sign, and it had certain elements to it. And now he's offering us a covenant of salvation where there's a sign, it's speaking in tongues, and there's some other elements to it where we accept uh, the blood of Jesus as uh, covering our sin, and we repent of our sin and uh, commit to not doing any of those things again, and so on. And, you know, we are baptized, and that's a whole other symbol from the flood that just like the waters of baptism saved Noah and his family, they were saved by water. The Bible says in 1 Peter uh, 3, 20 and 21, we also are saved by water. So we see all these parallels in Scripture, praise God. But it's a new covenant. It's a new day. It's a new promise. It's a new sign, praise the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." The author of the book is going to live in your heart. Praise God. He's going to live in your spirit. There's going to be the author of the book. He says, I'm going to write my laws on their hearts. Praise God. That the, the, the word of God would be written in our hearts. How does that happen? I've got the author of the book 
living inside. Praise God. Yes, I'm going to memorize Scripture. Yes, I'm going to study Scripture. I'm going to read it. It's going to come alive. Why? Because the author is living in me. Praise God. And when you get the author of the book living in you, his law gets written on your heart. Praise God. You now begin to desire the things of God. And you no longer desire the things of the world. But now you want to follow Jesus. And you want to follow his word. And you pursue after the things of God. And you pursue after his holiness, his righteousness, and his goodness. Why? Because it's all about him. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Acts 2, 14 to 18. I close with this. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. These people had just received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They might have been acting a little crazy. They were talking what seemed to be gibberish, and people thought maybe they were drunk. And Peter says, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. The flood was on all flesh. Now it's the spirit that's being poured out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Praise God. They're going to speak. To utter forth, declare a thing which can only be known by divine revelation. Praise God. You're going to speak in a language you've never learned. Praise God. It's a new thing. Praise the Lord. It's something you don't understand. You don't make up the words. God gives you the words. Praise the Lord. It's something the Holy Ghost speaks through you. Praise God. They spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And they shall prophesy. It doesn't necessarily mean they prophesied in the common language. But there's this this prophecy that they are going to speak in tongues. Praise. They're going to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit that gives the utterance. Praise God. Hallelujah. And if you're here this morning and you've not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can. Praise God. You can this morning. Praise the Lord. And we're not going to say, you know, see my tie, tie my tie, sell my Suzuki, buy a Honda. We're going to speak what God gives. Praise God. (laughs) I can't teach anybody how to talk in tongues. I can't teach anybody how to speak in tongues. It's when you yield to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost begins to speak through you. Praise God. It's the Spirit of the Lord that speaks through you when you receive the Holy Ghost. Praise God. So it's learning how to yield to God. If you can speak in tongues, you've begun to learn how to yield to God. That's really all it's about. Once you've got into that place where you're in prayer and you're feeling the Spirit of the Lord come upon you and your voice is beginning to uh, quiver a little bit, you just need to yield and allow the Lord to take over. That comes back to what we taught last hour about our flesh getting in the way. Praise God. But just yield to God. Praise the Lord. We're going to stand this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the Holy Ghost is the promise we receive at the altar before we go. Because God has commissioned us to go. Be fruitful. Multiply. Win souls. Reach people with the gospel. Teach all nations. Baptize them all in the name. But it starts at an altar where you receive a promise. Praise God. It starts with receiving a promise at an altar. And the promise this morning is not a rainbow but it is the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you're thankful that you've come through some stuff, that's the first altar. That's the first reason to come to the altar. If you're thankful, you've come through some stuff, you're here this morning, you've got a reason to be thankful, I want to invite you to this altar to just come and thank the Lord. Yes, Lord, you've brought me through. I've been... I've been through some stuff, but I'm, I'm in church this morning. I've, I've got a reason to be thankful. Hallelujah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing me through. Thank you for bringing me here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for being with me every step of the way. Thank you, Jesus. You've, you've preserved me and you've, you've kept me and you've, you've enabled me to be here. And Lord, I'm just so thankful. I want to offer myself as a sacrifice on this altar this morning. I want to give you my life. I want to give you myself. I want to give you thanks. Praise God. Can we come to this altar of thanksgiving? Hallelujah. Can we just offer him our thanks this morning? Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you have not yet received the promise, that's a reason to come as well. You've not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this is a great opportunity for you to come. Let us pray with you. Seek the face of God. Hallelujah. Allow the Lord to fill you. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you have a need in your life, I want to invite you to come to this altar and cast your cares upon the Lord. Hallelujah. He is here this morning and He is willing and ready and able to answer your prayers. Hallelujah. I want to invite you to come and pray at this altar. Praise God. We're going to seek the face of God. And If you're here this morning and you just, you just want to thank the Lord, you want to praise, hallelujah. Maybe you're here and you're, you're